Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ian Neal. I'm an uh, ASP, uh, ASP.NET web developer um, who's uh, used Neo4j for a few years. I'm a uh, visiting researcher at the University of Mainz in Germany. And uh, I'd like to thank Neo4j for the opportunity for talking about uh, codex and text as a graph approaches that I've been exploring. Um, I might turn over to uh, screen share so we can look at our, our slides. So what is the Codex? Uh, the Codex is a text as a graph solution with the aim of achieving the deep integration of text and data. What that is exactly, the, the deep integration I'll go into in the course of this talk. Um, it sounds uh, a bit grand, but basically uh, I'm trying to leverage the power of the graph to bring insights into uh, entities within a text and more importantly, between um, hundreds or thousands of, of texts. So the approach that I take is... Um, Ian, uh, yes? could you probably... Uh stop and start your screen sharing again because it's not showing right now okay let me just attempt that again okay let's see okay, yes we... much better cool sounds uh, good excellent Thank thanks thanks mark um, so the, the approach I take is to uh, manage what I call standoff, pro standoff, standoff property documents linked to graph entities. And as you can see in the graphic below, it's an example of um, a text um, uh, that I've uh, entered within a specially built editor uh, that enables visualization of um, complicated annotations and interaction with the graph. So behind all this is a graph meta model where entities are built up and defined by composition from a collection of statements and meta relations. Um, the whole system is easily extensible. You can add annotation types to the editor and you can add, you can build entities separately from the editor. So it's, it's a kind of bi-directional. Um, and as we can see in this, this text example here and uh, in, in further ones I'll show, text annotations are uh, high resolution and multi-dimensional. So by multi-dimensional, I mean that they overlap. Um, basically, it means that you can uh, look for connections between entities which overlap the same region of text. It's not just in a single dimension. So the technology behind this, um, well, obviously, Neo4j is the driving factor. Um, it's what enables us to find any insights into these, these documents and these entities. On top of that, I use uh, the, the Neo4j client API. This is in uh, uh, .NET. Um, the API was developed by Redify and um, maintained by Chris Scarden, um, a great Neo4j contributor. And um, on top of that, I've built uh, a number of extension methods and helper methods, which create a kind of um, almost a kind of mini domain specific language. It's too grand a term, but it, it kind of helps me deal with some, uh, some of the more visually complicated cipher um, uh, expressions. And um, this is all connected to uh, uh, ASP.NBC, the, the UI interface, the, the modals and forms are driven by knockout and uh, a custom standoff property text editor, which, which I've created. Now, these are the main entities in Codex, but for this talk, I'm only going to be looking at um, the, the ones highlighted in red. Um, and these are the, the main properties of them. So uh, we, we essentially have our texts, which is a, a text node. We have our standoff properties, which are standoff property nodes. And these standoff property nodes are our interface between our text and our graph entities. Now, the text as a graph approach um, 
there are various ways of doing this, but essentially at this point in time, it, it, it usually deals with uh, a text which has been broken up into, into word tokens or into, into tokens. And these tokens are then um, represented as a, as, as, a, as a linked list in the graph. Um, annotations are nodes which link to, uh, to uh, either a single word or, or, to, or to a range of words. I've taken a different approach with standoff properties. Using standoff properties, you can map not to the token level, you can map to a single character, you can map to between a character, but you can still represent, you can still have multi-dimensional overlapping annotations like you can with, with text as a graph. So, the, 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 the point of text to graph is to, to fully annotate a text. The idea is that you don't, the XML, which is um, a format used in the humanities for representing manuscript documents, for, for, um, for capturing annotations, for capturing meaning, this is fine for many cases, but when it comes to annotating the full meaning of a text, you find that texts aren't hierarchical in the way that XML is hierarchical. Um, there are meaning crosses boundaries, it crosses lines, it, it, it crosses paragraphs. And so you need a system which can um, easily map across, you know, uh, 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 across these boundaries. So I thought here I would illustrate very quickly, um, just with a series of, of screenshots here, of what happens when you try and annotate something with, with XML. Um, in XML and HTML, a range is represented by a node or an element um, within uh, a document object model, for example. So when you want to cross something, cross those elements, you have to split them. So we can see here that we take this example text here. Um, this is fairly understandable as um, HTML or, or XHTML. We've got a text, we've got various uh, annotations or bold annotation, uh, an italics annotation. And we can see that the text lines up in a uh, kind of um, containment way. You can see this, this is kind of understandable what this means. There's no overlap, there's nothing complicated. But then if we, you know, we can, we can annotate within the bold tag here, we can, so within the uh, bold tag, we can make something italics. Now we're starting to lose some of the um, readability of the text stream, but it's still fairly uh, manageable. But then when we start to uh, cross our annotations, so we cross our streams, then we get into really broken, um, I'll, I'll call this XML, because this is not, not far different from what would be represented in a, a, a TEI XML or text encoding XML document. Um, this XML would, would require special handling to, um, to export it as a readable text stream for further use in, say, natural language processing, um, text analytics, vector semantics, that kind of thing. Uh, and it's also not very manageable within your own system. Um, if you wanted to search within your texts, if you wanted to compare things within a text, um, you're now having to write complicated XPath XML expressions to make sense of this um, fragmented structure, which has been created by quite a simple use case. So I came across the, uh, the solution to this. Uh, it's a very simple data structure called uh, a standoff property. And essentially a standoff property um, contains a, a start index, an end index, and uh, a type. And the, these indexes are character positions within the text, and the type is the name of the annotation itself. Um, now, if you think about, we saw before how we had uh, bold and italics, those are stylistic annotations, so that would be the, the annotation type. Um, the, the beauty of standoff properties is that they're stored externally from the text stream, which is left in a plain format. So you have your plain text with no markup, no XML, no, no markdown, absolutely nothing, completely readable by human beings. Uh, you can submit it to a, a natural language service, but the annotations are represented as an array of standoff properties. 
because you're dealing with indexes, um, character positions, you can annotate, um, your annotations can, can annotate inside a word, uh, which you can't do with text as a graph, because as I mentioned before, text as a graph is at the level of the word token. Um, you can annotate a single character. You can even annotate between characters um, to insert, say, a footnote number, for example. Um, so this ability, this is quite quite a powerful ability to address a text with annotations. The annotation layers themselves can be filtered. So you can export a single layer if you could define a layer, say, as all italicized text. Um, or everything mentioning people or places, um, syntax information. So each, any of these things from using a simple JavaScript filter, you could decide, or a Cypher query, you could decide to, I'm only interested in a particular slice of these annotations. This would be quite difficult to do in, in XML. Um, and of course it supports what's called multi-dimensional queries, so we can now if we can represent this construct in uh, Cypher, in, uh, in the graph, we can do graph queries across uh, multi-dimensional annotations. So we finally have a bit of Cypher. So this is a representation of what of the schema for a standoff property graph. So I've described what a standoff property is. Um, which is the description of an annotation uh, within certain indexes in a text, but we still need to use this in a graph. So we have on the left um, a text node, which is which, for the most part, just contains the raw text. It's got a field called value. It contains the raw text. Then we have a standoff property node, which contains, as I mentioned, a start index, an end index, a type. It has a few other properties uh, which we can look into later, such as attributes and so on. But these are most; these are essentially non, you know, uh, optional properties. So we we can see that there's a relationship between the text and the standoff property. Simply a simple one of ownership. The text has a standoff property, and we can see as well that the standoff property can refer to something else. So I have a node in my system called an uh, called an agent which is a term I use to mean any kind of entity, a person, place, concept, whatever you like. And we can see here that our standard property uh, can optionally refer to an agent. And once we get into the agent, we're getting into the, into the graph matter model. Um, these other relationships uh, show that you can, you can use standoff properties in um, a graph way within themselves. Uh, for example, you could you could say that um, uh, a standoff property is a subset of another standoff property. So if you wish to have XML containment, uh, where one element contains another element, you can represent these ideas within standoff properties as well. So what I thought I might do, I might actually switch to the uh, codex interface and look at a practical example. So this is a, a letter from Michelangelo, the sculptor, to his nephew, Leonardo. And there's a lot of stuff going on the screen, but the main thing I'd like to focus on at the moment is this display here with the, the text. This is uh, a read-only display showing um, the annotated text. Um, if we click into various parts of the text, we can see something happens in this area down here I call the monitor. Basically, um, this shows you the annotations which overlap this position if, of your cursor. So I've built this, this editor. Um, basically, you can interact with your annotations and the text. And then we can see a whole bunch of other things, which we will look into shortly. But the first thing we might do is actually just open up this document. So what we have is something that I've tried to make as much like um, a basic text editor as possible. Um, 
The thing I didn't mention before was that while the stand of properties sound like a very nice way of getting around um, overlapping problems, um, of extracting markup from text, they do have one big downside. And that is if you change a single character, you delete or add, you threaten to invalidate all of those character indexes that you've created. So that what that means, for example, this, this property here, um, this red underlined a, uh, uh, entity, this agent, if I add something to this point, uh, if all those indexes are going to be off because I've added a new character. That's what's traditionally held back the standoff property approach because it's very fragile, it's very rigid. However, I thought of another way of approaching this, and that is to treat the text itself as a linked list. Um, so in a way, a kind of graph. So we're here directly changing a, a text graph in JavaScript. So I can type in something here. And um, Ian, yes, it's still showing your slide for me at least. Oh, okay, thank you. My apologies about that. Okay, um, can we see the codex screen? I'm having it come yes, through. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. My, my apologies about that. Um, so I, I'm assuming we didn't see this section here. So basically what, I, what I've done is I've created an editor using a linked list model that allows you to insert or delete text uh, without affecting these indexes. So I'll just type in something here. And visually, we can see they aren't affected. Um, but actually, at this point, in any case, um, we might not actually see anything. But we can do a, an export of that using the unbind button. And when we hit the unbind button, we can see our new text here. And we can see our properties. The ultimate proof is to rebind that. If I hit the rebind button, we can see that our new text is there. All of our annotations are still there. There's been no expensive recalculation of indexes because I've used a linked list to insert items and calculated the indexes at the final point. So this um, solution has worked for me so far and enables a kind of real-time text editing annotation experience. There are a few other things you need to, to implement with a, um, an overlapping annotation editor. You have to, um, to handle how to display these things, how to um, connect to them. You also what happen, you have to solve questions what happens about if you if you delete text that contains annotations, um, halfway through text, all this kind of stuff. But I've got it to a point where it, it's quite stable. I'll just reload this. Um, every change that you make to a every time you save a document, a, a version is kept of that so you can jump back to a previous version if necessary. So the Interface here looks rather like a text editor, but with these kind of strange buttons. These buttons uh, bring up windows which allow you to either reference Neo4j entities or to create them on the fly. So let's say, for example, we wanted to um, link to a particular entity here. Uh, we click this button, it pops up a window. Uh, it hasn't found anything with that particular name. We can search for any textual references to it. If we don't find something that we uh, we we um, in the system already, we could check um, the inline tab, which shows us all the entities in this particular document pre-populated for you. Um, or you could find something that's been recently created. Or you can create something brand new, a, a very basic um, version. So we might say. This entity is kind of a concept of a fool. 
and we can hit save and select. And we now have a new entity in the system. We click the, one of the little arrows here and we get a whole bunch of options for dealing with this entity. We can move our annotation around, which is useful and also kind of fun. Um, you can make it bigger or smaller. The main thing is that you can make these corrections once you've created them. Um, and you can also, you can switch, you can change to a different reference. You could clear this and find another entity if you annotated the wrong thing. Uh, but we can see here that the, the link is correct, that we've got it there. So at this point, I'll save this document. What happens at this moment, um, which seems quite simple, is that um, that text is unbound from the editor but, uh, as, as a JSON object. It's sent to the uh, web server. The web server uh, then constructs a standoff property graph like the screen I was showing you. And um, it tries to make as minimal changes as possible to the graph. But essentially, it, it rebuilds a graph and reattaches any references um, from the standoff properties to your, to your graph. So in short, we added a new annotation. And now we could click through to that entity itself. If we look at the Entities tab here, um, this visualizes our entities. We could click through to our brand new entity we've created. We can see where it came from what letter it came from, we can see how it was mentioned in the text and so forth. So if we pop back there for a moment, um, I'm going to attempt to load the, uh, the slides, get us back into there. Uh, we should be on the slide screen. The, excuse me for a second. Okay, so I'll just briefly cover some of the other chief entities we have in the system, and um, because they are kind of principal, they they are the glue that holds these these texts together. So one of the concepts we have is a a meta well, what I call a meta relation, and I call that because it is a relationship like a standard Neo4j relationship in some ways, but it takes a, a different approach. Um, it's a little bit like uh, the, I realized later, it's a bit like the, the Marvel uh, comics approach of, uh, dynamically create, uh, of, of dynamically creating relationships, but there's a, one other component to it. So a meta relation is, is something, is a kind of relationship which the user themselves can create within Codex. Uh, that's primarily how relationships are built within Codex. You can create it from within the text document itself. If you see a relationship, for example, we have here, Michelangelo is a dear friend of Giorgio Vasari. That was a relationship I saw mentioned in the text itself. I could create that in line using one of those modal windows. Um, when you create a, a meta relation, you specify the two sides of it, the parent, so for example, parent of or child of. Um, and you do that because um, you both dynamically create it, but also the way that it's represented in the graph model. Uh, there are no, there is no parent of child of here. We have simply an agent being related to a meta relation hypernode. So this means that we can have a parent or a child here. They're both related to the same thing, and we can but we can retrieve them both at the same time. We don't have to know what direction the the uh, the arrow was going. We simply can say, "I'm going to get the parent-child um, situation or complex." Um, the other thing that we can do is because we're now dealing with with the graph here, we're dealing with an agent related to a meta relation, and this meta relation kind of you know uh, empty node is related to this. It's called a, a meta relation type, which where, is where you define um, both sides of this relationship, you know, parent, parent of, child, child of. We could also, could also link this meta relation type or schema to uh, a concept, which is um, a hierarchically organized uh, collection of tags in the system. So um, I don't want to call it an ontology because it implies a uh, sort of top-down structure. 
but it's a very free floating way of building up hierarchical structures within codex. So you could say simply, um, you have uh, a Java programmer is a subset of a programmer, for example. And so both of those nodes would be concepts related by a subset of. So here we could say, for example, that this meta relation type is a type of parent child relationship. We can then go further than that. We can say this, this concept parent child is, is a subset of family relationships. And that's a subset of genetic relationships or something like that. And the power of this is that you can now query the graph in a higher order way. So you think about all the different kind of relationships were actually, actually grouped. You have parent and child, sibling or marriage, son-in-law, mother-in-law, etc. You can start to think of them as, uh, you know, as higher order relationships, a family, a set of family relationships, a set of friendship relationships. So you can imagine how useful this technique might be when dealing um, with, say, historical documents where you're looking for all of Michelangelo's family, all of his professional connections, all of his friends. You can run a query which would get you back that information in one go. Um, I'll attempt to switch back to Codex. Now, what we can see when we have that information, um, we can see a listing here of Michelangelo's relationships. Um, but more interestingly, we can start to bring that back into, uh, the, uh, into the text itself. So we can start, because we've created these entities and these entities have these relationships, we can ask uh, the graph, um, can you find me, for example, sentences where Michelangelo and any of his brothers are mentioned? And I've created a view here where each entity is color coded so we can see easily um, a sentence where Michelangelo and uh, four of his, four of his uh, sorry, uh, some of his, his brothers are mentioned, you know, Leonardo, Buonarotto, uh, Giovanni Simone and Sigismondo. Um, we can also, Uh, because we have that information, I've built a very rough and ready version of this. But basically, we essentially have this graph information, which we can extract from a text. I've just started playing with uh, Sigma JS to visualize graph relationships. This is a visualization of the relationships of all the entities within this, this letter from Michelangelo and how they're connected. And I intend to build uh, a more functional uh, interface where you can click through and um, connect other texts which are linked to these these entities here. The other important element uh, is statements, which I'll pop back into this slide for a second. Um, they enable you to create uh, a relationships between multiple entities within a text. A simple way of thinking about this is an event. So you would have, say, Michelangelo went to Rome with Leonardo, his nephew, not uh, da Vinci. So you would say you have Michelangelo, you have Leonardo, you have Rome. These are agents which are all related around a central activity, which is arriving at a place. Um, you might have a time as well, so you, you can represent that below. The statement um, schema allows you to capture in, in, in a simple way, um, but quite an extensible way, we can capture quasi-grammatical relationships. So we can see here we've got a subject object, but we can also have things like at, with, according to. So um, if we pop back to our text here, Okay, uh, Michelangelo is probably a better example. I just wanted to find an example of an event, but 
Um, and we're seeing lots of examples of traits here, which is interesting, but for the next part. Okay, so for example, we can see here that Michelangelo in this text here, uh, he says, I used to consider that sculpture was the lantern of painting. So we can represent an event. In this case, a thought is a kind of event. So using uh, this um, property here on, on the roll, we can say that according to Michelangelo, who was in his letter, um, he had uh, a thought that that Michelangelo thought that sculpture is the lantern of painting. So we can establish either quite simple uh, relationships or we can build more complicated ones. Um, once we have those statements, we can we can represent them in our text and we can we can go to any one of these particular parties. So we could go to um, the statement screen. We could see a breakdown of what's in the statement. We could go to... Um, we could go to Varchi here, we could see from his point of view how he's connected to this statement. So we can start to capture the uh, discrete um, uh, events within history. Um, and these events don't have to be just actual events, they could be thoughts, they could be um, qualities of things as well. So for example, here, um, we have um, uh, using, we're using the statement in a, in a slightly different way to represent a trait of somebody. Um, so, for example, the trait of being of being famous. So, if we pop back to our um, slide here, we can see that um, we normally represent um, the the uh, ontology of something or its its classification by a type. So, we might say an is a relationship. So, we say Savonarola, who was a Renaissance preacher, would say is a preacher or is a man. But this leaves out a lot of interesting stuff that we have in historical documents that we can break down into traits. So I've reused this statement concept to represent every statement about Savonarola um, is represented as, as a discrete trait. You can think of this, I call this an aspect-oriented ontology. You can think of it in, in, in Java or C Sharp as being uh, an aspect on the method or an interface which is descriptive and each of these things is an aspect uh, or a trait so we can see here that um, Savonarola is, is according to Landucci is given the trait of a man of holy life and so on and so forth so if we go into codex we can actually query our entities on the basis of specific traits so for example we could look at what are all the Florentine things in our system? And logically, you're going to get back a lot of people, Florentine people. Um, but we can also see that we get back things like Florentine corn. Um, this might be interesting if you're a historian of agriculture. You're looking for um, you're looking for you know, uh, food consumption. You can actually see uh, you can, you know, we've got worthy citizens. We can uh, attach whatever traits we like. We can take things which are a little bit more abstract, like the concept of uh, many having more than one. We can see that something is described as you know, the the many nuns in the nunneries of Russia. So we've given them the trait of being many. So I call this an aspect-oriented ontology, and it's something that I'm implementing with. The complete letters of Michelangelo and the diary of Landucci, his contemporary, and I'm hoping to find some interesting connections here on um, uh, this sort of aspect level. So we're just about done. I wanted to talk a little bit as well about the technology side of it in terms of the, the C sharp. I've demonstrated um, the use of the editor, the the graph models. Uh, at least just a very small number of the graph models. But this is another tool which um, I've added to the system, which has helped me uh, iterate fairly quickly. So Neo4j client is a uh, C-sharp API um, that sits on top of the Neo4j driver. It allows you to switch between REST and Bolt seamlessly. It gives you a, a Cypher expression builder, which we can see here. Mostly the, uh, the functions are keywords. It, 
handle safe 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 parameterization of values, and it has a very powerful deserializer turning uh, the results into complex objects. Now, this already is quite powerful and useful, but I found as I was working with it, I wanted a little bit of distance from dealing with um, hard-coded text labels. So I created a set of extension methods, which I call uh, Neo4j Client Vector, which uh, is on GitHub. And to do this, I created a, a vector generic class where you can represent a path in the system. So a start node, an end node, and a relationship. And basically what it does is it generates um, the naming for you. So it generates um, the, the cipher expression with the label names and relationships and so on. And you can see here that you don't have to worry about what direction the arrows are going in because that's all contained within the vector class. Um, it knows what direction the relationship goes. We don't have to put any labels in here for any uh, uh, text rel relationships. And in some case where we have um, a transitive kind of relationship here, text have it has a property, the property has an agent. Um, we can even represent them without any relationships in between because it, can, it understands that uh, you, you're focused on the nodes here. So I find that this kind of, um, uh, these extension methods for me have helped me iterate fairly quickly over it. I can rename relationships and labels, which I've done, um, I can rename them within the vector class without having to re rewrite any cipher. Um, I can, I find myself dealing simply with the cipher node patterns. I don't have to worry about the visual, what we call the, the visual noise of all the other aspects here. And there's a couple other useful, very simple additions to this, which allow me to um, build these dynamically driven form inputs where we have, for example, searching by name, by uh, uh, children of code and so on. Rather than doing a complicated uh, set of if, if statements, we can control all of this within these extension methods here. Um, and on top of that, I built a, a simple pagination uh, library as well, which will take the, uh, the cipher query and it will automatically skip and limit for you. And uh, with a bit of reflection, it can work out um, you know, the, the names of, of nodes and so on. Um, it also has a way of dealing with the order by statement in, for me, which is a more natural way of dealing with it by using these, these parameters. So that's kind of the, the C-sharp side of things. Um, I think we might be running a bit over time. I mean, there's certainly a lot more I could show if we had, if we, if we had the time, but I don't want to to take up more than my allotted period. Um, so I'll just ask Michael if, uh, should we head over to the Hunger Games questions? Yeah, uh, I think there's, so there's one question from John uh, directly. Uh, what percentage of the annotations of a document would you consider automatic and what is manual? In other words, would you be able, would we be able to give Codex a volume of documents and would we get at least some basic attributes from that already? Okay, that's an excellent question. Um, to some extent, I can answer that here. For example, we have um, something I didn't mention is the uh, natural language integration. Uh, so Codex is integrated with the Google uh, Google Cloud's natural language API. So, for example, if you click the named entity recognition button, you get back um, a bunch of, of candidates. So they're not all automatically assigned. Uh, I find with historical texts that a lot of these entities don't appear in Wikipedia. They're not out there in the knowledge graph. They're very specific to, to the context. But what, what I found useful was to say, well, can you identify all the all of the nouns for me? Can you find who they are? So for example, um, if we, we've got the, the entity of Rome here, I can very quickly find Roam in the system, if it exists already, I can also create that. I can select it, it turns gray. It's been, it's been uh, uh, acquired. I can then copy and place any references to Roam. And so Roam, any, anywhere else in the text gets updated as well. Um, 
so that's not a full system. It's, it's, I mean, it is possible to plug in to the rest of the, uh, the Google NLP with the entity, a named entity recognition, and to get, um, for example, to go through to Wikipedia. But I prefer to do a combination of uh, assisted, sort of, you know, machine assisted and, and hand annotated um, annotations because it gives you more control over that. Um, and this, this button as well will do uh, pronouns if there's any that haven't been annotated. It's only showing ones that haven't been annotated at this point. But the other aspect to it is um, you have as well the ability to call out to Google Syntax API, which you click this button, it will generate syntax and sentiment. Because all of those things, syntax and so on, if it, if it maps back to text, can be represented as annotations themselves. So these are statically static annotations generated by Google. This is a sentiment analysis of this text. Um, we can also look at the syntax of that text as well. Um, we can use that information, that syntax information, for example, we could say, we could use that, you know, this is where the multi-dimensional querying comes in. We could say for, for a particular entity like Luca Landucci, uh, find me anywhere where he is in the third person. And it will bring you back a sentence where that occurs and automatically highlight those references for you. Um, we could even raise that to a higher level and say, uh, looking at the morphology or the dependency tree of that syntax tree, um, bring that information back as well. I think maybe there wasn't one found in that case. Um, I will just very quickly review as well. We can see here with that syntax information, we can see entities which are syntactically linked to Landucci in the text. So where they are linked by the grammar to Landucci. So um, this gives you an overview of every text that Landucci is in what is grammatically linked to, to Landucci, um, or who is in the same sentence as Landucci, thanks to Neo4j's uh, incredible uh, uh, index-free adjacency. Uh, these queries run very quickly. We can see every entity which appears in every text, in every sentence with Landucci, or we can do it at the text level as well. Um, we can query other parts of speech within the same sentence and so forth. Uh, but that's basically where you have some of that integration there between uh, generated information like uh, syntax and between hand annotated information. Uh, and Chris, uh, Christoph has a question. Do you have any mechanism to deal with metaphor or other non-literal text and it's mapping to literal state of affairs? I don't have anything to do that automatically. Um, I am. I've been talking with uh, Dino Bozzetti, uh, the Italian uh, digital humanist, about applying vector semantics. He's very interested in vector semantics. So we're going to see if it's possible to generate a vector semantic analysis of a text corpus and to bring that back into Codex in some, in some way. Um, but on, on a manual level, I uh, have been looking at actually creating a kind of annotation like a metaphor or a, uh, what I call a, uh, a, a connotation or a association where you could, you could say that something uh, has a connotation of something else in the text. Uh, the, the standoff property editor, which is the, uh, the text editor I showed you, that is totally open source and on uh, GitHub right now with a certain amount of documentation. Um, and and uh, a demo. Um, the Codex MBC side, I've got to basically put up onto onto GitHub and, and make public. I'm still cleaning up the code a bit and adding some features. But it is it is intended to be open source. 